baptized in his name.
time, give the Lord a praise offering.
so many things that I never expected to see. I preached about a lot of things before I arrived. But as you grow older in life, you will run up on some of those things you thought you knew. And then you'll get an experience. No one can give you an experience. You have to learn that yourself. You may hear somebody's experience and try to tell it, but it'll never be yours until you have it. And that's the reason young people make so many miserable mistakes because they think they know. A lot of things I thought I knew. But since I have grown to this age, many of the things I thought I knew, I found out I didn't know it as well as I thought I did. So they should speak, and you should bring wisdom. We want to thank my sister, Bishop Clement, very beautiful. Mr. Hill. He told me, that Bishop, if you die, I'll kill you. <laughs> Bishop Mason was barred from this state for eight years because someone with a loose mouth thought they could just say whatever they want to say. You can now, you, you, you can, there's freedom of speech, but yet you better be careful what you say. Because folk can sue you for slander from the pulpit. It's been done this past year. Many of the ministers have, have to pay mal, what is that, mal? Malpractice from the pulpit. Because they insulted folks from the pulpit. Someone came from someone's church that's sitting here right now and told me they wanted to go and go sue that church because some of the sisters of the church got after them about wearing lipstick. Wasn't my church, but it was another church. It came over me because you're the bishop and said, I think I don't think the pastor knows about it. But some of the sisters insulted me about my lipstick. Now you people must not carry your old missionary zeal too far. Get your lips straight is not the answer. And you can rub it off of your lip, but if you don't get it out of your heart, it's still in your heart. And, and being filled with the Holy Ghost don't give you the, uh, the, the satisfaction to go around picking folks. Right. Playing muddy people. So those ladies, those two young people, they thought it was ridiculous that they should pick and jump on them because they had lipstick. Now some folks have rubbed the lipstick off of that lip and that lip is still running. <laughs> so you've got to be wise as a serpent. Harmless as a dove. You've got to be discreet with your words. You can run high the man or when I was a boy, I remember the preacher came to my father's church and ran the people away. But I'm gonna preach it like it is. I'm straight. And I'm going to tell it just like it is. And some of you folks sitting up here, you ain't nothing. And they left and never did come back. And now some folks call themselves strict and straight. But you can be stupid and straight. That does nothing. That, 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 you can't even catch a fish with that kind of bait. You've got to entice and lure a fish. Why not a serpent? But harmless is a good. And uh, you, this is a new day now, and things that we used to say, I used to say, I wouldn't dare say anymore. Because it's unwise, it's not, it is the day that you can, now you've got to be discreet with your words. Because if you're not, they'll take you right down to the courthouse. <laughs> Around the wall was trying to stop the folks from building the wall. Don't be no fool, that wall ain't no sand. If he built it, it ain't gonna stand. If a fox run on it, they will knock it down. And they told him, come on down, man, come on down. He said, I'm sorry, I can't come down because I'm doing a good work. And I can't afford to come down. I'm building a wall. And he wasn't a preacher, he was a lady. 
he was a cupbearer to the king, but he loved Jerusalem. He loved the position of God's people there in Jerusalem, and he couldn't bear to see the walls down. And he went back. He, he, he would even take the, uh, the companionship and the things that the king offered because he bragged so much about God. The uh, king offered him an army to go with him. He said, no, God will provide for me. And he went on down there and rebuilt the walls. So built we the walls. Why? Because the people had what? And we're going to see Mother Kelly is, 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 has been incapacitated. She had a seizure on the other Sunday, but always been uh, top notch in the rap. And now we all know my troubles. Praise is an insult to the devil. The devil wants you to come to church looking sad and melancholy. He wants you to bring all your grumpy, growly, grouchy, melancholy feelings. But God has given us even directions on how to come to church. Enter into his gates with what? You look real funny coming to church half mad. Looking sad. You just, you just to know I'm going to church ought to make you feel good. I'm going to where the throne of grace is. I'm going where the altar is erected. I'm going where God's presence is inhabiting. And that of itself it gives me an anticipation and great joy. Praise. Praise. Now, it's a little different between thanksgiving and praise. Thanksgiving, you're talking to God, but praise, you're magnifying God. Thanking God for his goodness. David said, seven times a day will I pray for him. Right, and then he said in the 69th Psalm, he said, at midnight, I'll rise and praise him again. Right, Looking like I forgot something. Yeah. And for fear that I did, I'm going to get up at midnight and praise him again. Uh, my wife was so sick. sick with cancer, she being, she kept it with me quite a while. They wanted me to know that she was stricken with that malady, that awful disease. And it's something that, that, that uh, puts anybody in low key. Look at how tough you are and how vibrant and vigorous you are. Just to know you've got cancer puts you in low key. Now uh, the devil talks to your mind. Tells you you are not going to get well. You've got an incurable disease. He talks. He, he communicates with your mind and he drains you of all your joy and hope. Takes your faith and kills it. Amen. But uh, you can learn how to praise God in spite of that. You can defeat the devil. Amen. Praise gets on the devil's nerves. Praise makes him angry. Makes him mad. And he makes. And when you can praise him in the spite of situations and conditions. I didn't never, I had never, never read that scripture in the Acts. I got my reader, Brother Tony. He's right there. I want him to read this for me. Acts the 12th chapter. The 21st through the 23rd verse. Tragic stories about not giving God the praise. Amen. Mother, who used to come from Philadelphia here, she created that song, giving the praise. And people were healed and miracles were wrought. So many wonderful things came to pass by just giving him the praise. All right, let's read that. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Say amen. There's the thing, the people turn them off, you know, sometimes people can mess you up. So you've got to learn how to accept the praise of the people who have a grain of salt. If you're not level-headed and sober in your mind, folks can push you overboard praising you, making you think you're what you are not. Amen. Everybody can't take praises and, and remain level-headed. Just a little praise pushes them overboard and they lose that balance and topple down to the ground. 
Caleb was talking and giving his oration, and when he gave his oration, the people thought it was a God speaking. And he accepted it because he did. The angel came and smote him. And the Bible said his flesh was given to the word because he failed to give God the glory. Right now. I know you know the story of Herod, I mean, of uh, uh, the great king Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was standing out in the midst of his great kingdom, Babylon. And when he looked at the breadth and the magnificent and the magnitude of the splendor, he looked at it and said, all oh, this I do with my own hand. This is the glory of Babylon, and it's my glory because I built it myself, hanging gardens and walls of beauty and grandeur. Walls were wide enough for full torn chariots to ride upon towers upon the top of the wall, swinging gardens and all of the wonderful things of architectural splendor. And he stood there in the midst of it and he gave himself the glory. God didn't say nothing, but God seemed to become insulted because he didn't give God an inch or an ounce of glory. God seemed to say, oh, you did it, huh? And in that very moment, the Bible said God touched him and changed his digestive organs took away his appetite for food and gave him a cool instead of a stomach. Put him out in the past and said, I'm going to let you stay out there for seven years, a seven-year course in learning how to respect God. Seven years. Lived with the cows and the mules and the horses and the sheep and the goats. His fingernails grew out like bird claws and his hair like eagle feathers. And out there the king was a raving maniac. Took him off the throne where he was beautiful and magnificent in his handsome splendor, undressing from his grandeur. Then he's out there with the cows and the horses. God said, stay there now till you learn your lesson. And after he had learned his lesson, he came out and he was the greatest one to give tribute to God. You all read the story of what he said after he learned his lesson. He gave God the highest praise. Gave God the loudest sounding words of adoration and glory after seven years of learning a lesson. That's not my text today. In the book of Matthew, the 14th chapter, briefly, I'm going to read this scripture to you today, and I want you to listen at the language of the text, because the language of the text is very interesting in the way that God expresses himself, or uh, the way the writings of scripture is so transcribed. It's marvelous how God has protected the scriptures and written it in such a way that no one can improve upon it or can do anything to change it or modify it in any way. The 14th chapter of Matthew, beginning at the 28th verse. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee upon the water. And he, and he said, come. And Peter went down from the boat and walked upon the waters to come to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and took hold of him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, Wherefore did it thou doubt? And when they were gone up into the boat, the wind ceased. And they that were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Say amen. amen. This is the story of one of the most wonderful pre-Pentecostal experiences of Peter. While it reveals an element of failure, that is not his only quality. Neither is it the chief aim or the chief one story that is being uh, projected in this story. That element of failure, however, has so impressed us that we are in danger of failing to observe that it was a failure on a singular high level. Right now, there are some things that you can get credit for because of the attempt that you are making to do something unusual. Some folks never fail because they will never attempt nothing. And therefore, you have no reason to fail because you haven't tried to do anything. But this was a failure in an hour of an exalted and Christ-honoring experience. 
while we must not even know the figure, we ought to consider it in the light of the whole story. For it is a story full of bright and tender light. In the paragraph, there are the sentences separated by a very definite break. Matthew made use of a well-known Hebrew literary form in writing this story. It is called polysynthetism and consists of the leaking of event to event by the repetition of the word and right. in order to indicate a sequence that means the continuity of the same story. Yeah. You will bear with me if I draw your attention to somewhat grotesque emphasis in reading the first sequence as it is found in the verses 28 and 29. Ah. Listen at the reading of it. It starts off with the word and, which means there's something proceeding before we get to the language of this verse. Uh -huh. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee upon the waters. And he said, come. And Peter went down from the boat. And walked upon the waters to come to Jesus. The sequence is quite as evident and even more marked in the second part of the story, beginning in the middle of the verse 30. And the sequence begins by the sudden break of the word but. Now whenever you get to the word but, which is a conjunction, it changes the whole story. You cannot say but and keep in the same sequence because but changes the whole story. I don't care what you're talking about. When you get the book, you got to change the story. Right. I may say Dr. Clemens is one of the greatest men I ever met. Yes. But yes. now everybody stops and listen when you say but <laughs> because they don't know you're going to say what you intended to say before you said but. <laughs> because most people usually say what has been hidden and covered up after they have said but. Right. The, uh, man sent his secretary to the conference and said, take notes. Don't write everything, but every time they say but, you start writing. <laughs> because usually that's when they tell the real gist of the story. So between these two parts of the one story are uh, consisting in two sequences. There is a sudden break introduced by the opposite word but. But when he saw the wind. Amen. Uh, he, he was afraid. Immediately we are brought into a new set of circumstances. Then as suddenly we come to the next end and beginning to say, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and took hold of him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore did it thou die? And they that were in the boat worship him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. All right. Now let us consider first what this story reveals to us of an exalted experience. Uh -huh. That of Peter chronicled in the first sequence. Secondly, what the story reveals of a sudden defeat recorded in the break that interrupts a uh, moment in the movement of the second sequence. And finally, what the story reveals of a fulfilled purpose in the second sequence. Yeah. Briefly, let everybody repeat that exalted experience, an exalted experience. a sudden defeat, a sudden and a fulfilled purpose. I particularly desire to lay emphasis on the first part of the story, that of the exalted experience of Peter. Uh -huh. Over and over again, it, it, it has been affirmed that his desire was one of presumption. You know we got a lot of people who won't give you credit for nothing that you do for God. They try to make like you were showing off or you had an ulterior reason. They didn't want to give Peter the credit for wanting to walk the water. And they tried to throw off on him and make like it was presumptuous. The answer to that charge is that when he expressed his desire, his master said, come. And he never encouraged mere presumption. God don't fool with you when you're trying to show out. God will not endorse you when you try to take advantage of a spotlight or try to make a display for your own personal gain. You must look carefully again at the story and attempt to understand it a little more particularly if we would gather the full value. Right. Now in that first sequence, we have record of a great adventure, of the divine order for that venture, 
and of the great adventure which resulted therefrom. The great adventure is recorded for us in these first words. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee upon the water. Right. Well, we're immediately arrested by the fact that our story begins with this word and, and therefore cannot be considered complete in itself. You must go back then in order to seek the inspiration of the request of Peter. And here we need not tell for the whole story is very familiar. The disciples had been sent by the Lord uh, across the sea, told them go to the other side. Right. And in obedience to his command, they had set the prow of the vessel toward the opposite side of the lake. Yes. Right. Then the wind was contrary. Now Jesus knew that they were going to run into some stormy weather and control the winds. And he sent us into control the winds. When I came to Brooklyn, he knew that my way would not be so peaceful, but he arranged it like that. He moved some situations that I thought was unpleasant, but he was doing it for my good. Sometimes God knocks props of others to teach us how to trust him. I tried to find some way to get security, to get money, to put my tip up. And everybody I went to was broke. Oh, they had nothing to offer. Bishop Jones had told me, said, son, when my father died, I'll be your father. And I said, I know I'm going to Bishop Jones. And I went to Bishop Jones, but he had a very logical excuse. He said, oh, T, my son is over in Africa, and I've got to send for him. And I won't be able to help you now, Brother F.D. And I went out with my head down and my spirit low. Everywhere I went, I was blocked and stopped. And the devil wanted to tell me that uh, they, they, they're against you. Every time you're blocked and stopped, it's not because somebody's against you. It's God's way of teaching you how to trust him. If you go to every time a stick pop and every time something happens, you're going to get an answer, you won't learn nothing. He preached, Brother Clemens preached in patience, possess your soul. It takes time to learn how to trust God. Therefore, God sent him over said, go to the other side. He knew even though he was in the mountain praying that they were going to run into some control to win. And I'll tell you, friends, this is something about life that makes many people not even to pass through life without a grumble and a complaint. Because they think that every day ought to be sunny. But life carries with it these ups and downs, these bitter experiences, these things that look like it ought to be when you're trying to do your best. Some of the best saints have cried out in that hour. Uh, one of the judges of Israel, he said, Lord, I've done the best. I haven't defrauded anyone. Job cried. I've been true to everybody. Oh, yeah. I helped the wayfaring men. I fed the beggars and I fed the hunger. I have not deprived anyone of anything that I could do. Oh, yeah. And why should I have to be carried through such a vigil of sorrow and such a suffering? Oh, yeah. He had to learn it by God's method and God's way. The devil himself. And I think that one of the scriptures that it depicts Job, he said, he picked me up and thrown me down and broke me into pieces. Then he picked me back up and put me back together and then lifted me up. He said, have you considered my servant Job? If you're not able to be broken and thrown down and then picked up, you're not going to be able to be lifted up and show in whom my servant Job. And so here we are. They went out into these contrary winds. They got in the middle of it. You know, God lets us get in the middle of it. Too far to cross and too far to get back. Yes, sir. These were not novices and these were committed men. These were all disciples of Jesus. And sometimes we think because we are holy, we ought to escape. Yeah. Think because we live in saved and we're fasting twice a week that this shouldn't be our lot. But when you're born of a few days, you're full of trouble. You've got to bear your love. He knows the way we take. He knows that he designs and plans for us these bitter experiences. And he sends us into the contrary wind. Suddenly there was added to the terrors of the storm the nameless terror of an approaching phantom. Jesus was in the mountain praying. Yeah. Up there praying, and in the midst of his prayer, he felt the pull of his disciples. He, he was sensitive to some urgency. 
some need and some concern. He seems to know when we're in desperate need. Yeah. He seems to know when we're at the breaking point. Yeah. He seems to know when we can't take anymore. Yeah. And he steps right in. But when he got out to the dock, the last boat had gone. Yeah. And he had no way to get to them, but if he wants to get to you, he'll get to you. Sometimes it looks like we're lost from Jesus. It looks like we're insulated and cut off, but he'll find a way to reach you. Maybe on the desert, like Hagar, out there in loneliness. That's the hard kill the swamp. The people we served with yes, have abandoned us and left us in the desert. A desert experience. Yes. Like Sister Hagar that was invigorated into the life of Abraham and Satan. Yes. Not any doing of all, no sin against them, sinning. And some people are more wrong than they're wrong. No yes. sin against them, sinning. Yes. They have to bear the stick and bear the pain. Yes. I've been in the angry sea. I've been 
Jesus, come! 